I think, I think you can get started, Elizabeth. So uh, just to introduce Elizabeth Dupree, is a PhD student um, at McGill and uh, Neuro, and um, she is involved in uh, many different open source projects uh, in the Jupyter ecosystem and also in sort of the neuroimaging in Python and machine learning um, ecosystems for neuroimaging. And she is also a phenomenal teacher and uh, we'll tell you all about getting GitHub today. Take it away. Thanks so much, Ariel, and thanks so much to, to all the organizers for um, setting this up. I know this 2020 has been an interesting experiment in so many ways, but I'm so happy that Neuro Academy has made it into 2020, and we can we can talk about how amazing all of these tools and, and community are. Um, so today, I want to just introduce a little bit Git and GitHub, which are, uh, I would say, perhaps the most popular version control uh, duo in the world right now. I, I first just want to start with a little bit of motivation about why we as scientists should really be thinking about and caring about version control in all of our work. Um, and then I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of, of how we can actually do it. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of a heads up. This lesson in its original full form is designed to take three hours. We probably won't get through all of that because if you'll notice our time allotted is not three hours and that's completely fine. Um, the lesson is designed such that it can be a resource for you moving forward. And in particular, if you know you decide to do group projects later in the week, or if you'd like to come back and, and work on some open source projects, you know, anytime, um, it's really good to have this kind of in your back pocket so you can, can easily interface uh, with these version control systems and exchange with the broader community. So first, let's kind of step back and let's think about something that may be really familiar if you're a graduate student like me or if you've already been through graduate school uh, something that may have happened to you in the past so you're writing a paper you're really excited because you've got the full draft you think it's it's really good it's ready to go and so you say it's the final version um, then you take it to your advisor and they just have you know a few comments not too many so you're like, that's fine, that's fine. I'm gonna go ahead and update and now it's final, second revision. Still final, it's pretty clear. Um, but now you take it back to your advisor for a couple more rounds um, and you, know, you get some more collaborator feedback. And now you see that it's revision six with comments, then it's revision eight with the fifth round of comments with some corrections on those comments. Um, and then finally, you end up with something like final revision 22, comments 49, corrections 10, why did I come to grad school, right? Um, and so hopefully you've never experienced something quite this bad um, in, terms, in terms of the file naming itself. But I think we all can be really sympathetic that there's no one point in our research or in our uh, progress where we're really confident like this is the version. Um, and so it, you know, it takes that iterative process and coming back over time to when you see, okay, what is the final product and, and what is something that was part of this iteration. Um, and you may be saying to yourself like, okay, that's, that's maybe something I could understand happening, but you know, I usually work by myself or you know, I work with a small team and I really, I've never experienced something quite like that. Um, and to you, I'd say there's still a really strong case for version control in that your number one collaborator will always be yourself from six months ago. And she doesn't answer emails. I've tried. I've tried the emailing yourself from six months ago route. It doesn't work. Um, and so you still need to know what kind of was happening at each step in the process, um, even if you're working by yourself or in a small team. And so if you don't have version control and you've got that whole file naming scheme that the PhD comic just showed, you can end up with something like this, which is a story told in file names, right? And so you have test, retest, re-retest, like not bad, use this one, starting over. Um, so if I leave this directory for six months and I come back, do I use, use this one? Do I use starting over? Like it's unclear 
um, what exactly I should do. And that makes it really difficult uh, to know how we can work with this project and, and uh, continue moving forward with this project, or even how we would allow someone else to start working with this project. You know, if you get this directory from someone else, you definitely would have to include a lot of explanation about what are all of the different files and what do they mean and, and why are they titled like this? Um, so the way I really like to think of version control, what we'll be talking about today is as a conversation. So it's a conversation that you have with your collaborators to explain, you know, uh, the different files you have, uh, why you've made certain changes on those files. And it's also a conversation that you have with yourself because over time, uh, as you, you know, take a break, even for just a few um, months or a, a few weeks, if your memory is as bad as mine, um, you may find that you need the little reminders to explain, okay, why did I do this to the data? Or what was this added to do? What is, what is the point of this uh, particular script? And so thinking about version control as a conversation makes it really easy to see why it's so, so important to what we're doing as scientists. Um, but just like every conversation, there's a lot of jargon. Um, particularly every, every conversation around science, right? So when you're first starting out with version control, there are a lot of words that are just kind of strange. Um, commit, push, pull, fork, clone. These are all words that maybe we use in everyday English. Maybe some of them we really don't. Um, but they all have very specific meanings in Git and GitHub. And we're going to learn today what those meanings are and how you can use them fluidly. And just to point out, like any language, uh, it takes time and it takes practice. So today I just want to give you a walkthrough so you can really see how all these things interchange with one another. But it's through practice that you'll start to feel like you're really speaking the language fluidly or having that conversation fluidly. And that just comes with time. Um, and in the meantime, you'll have resources like these to look back on and, and really help you move along with it. Okay, so some people say, all right, this sounds good. Um, I'm, I'm in, I'm gonna use Git. But then when you try and think about what it means, you end up with something like this comic. So the comic is an XKCD one and it reads, this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool, how do we use it? No idea. Just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere delete the project and download a fresh copy. Um, so while this is certainly one strategy, it's not the one that I'm gonna advocate for here. Um, I think spaces like Neuroha Academy and the community that's here are the perfect ones to really delve in um, and to learn how this is working in a way that can make sense for you beyond just if you get an error, delete the project and start over. Um, because that's what, while that's a step, our goal here today is to get beyond that step and to get it so that, again, you feel like you're actually taking part in a conversation. And you'll have lots of time to practice with uh, folks here from Neuro Academy if you choose to do the group projects or you know, with anyone in the open source community over the longer term. Okay, so we're gonna dive in, but just a first, a few messages I want you to carry throughout. Um, the first is Git isn't easy. If this is the first time that you're seeing Git and GitHub, it's a little overwhelming and that's completely okay. Um, this workshop is designed to get you started and it only becomes natural with practice, just like any language. And lots of people make mistakes with Git all the time, so much so that there's even a website called dangitgit.com, which just lists some really common mistakes that people have um, and the quick ways to get out of them. So. You're not alone if you're, if you're uh, experiencing this for the first time. Everyone's gone through it and it's, it's really nice to see kind of the community of support that's built around it. All right, I had to make this pun. Um, so if you're ready to get started, make sure you have a GitHub account. Um, if you don't, they take just a second to sign up for, um, but I'm gonna assume that you already have one. And then we're gonna be walking through this material so it's at this URL, iandupree.github.io slash git course. It's, I've also put it in the Slack channel for this course. Um, and if you'd like, I've copied the markdown files that we're gonna be walking through into the Neuro Academy curriculum folder on your Jupyter Hub. So we're gonna walk through this course uh, online and we're gonna execute the commands in the Jupyter Hub. Cool, whoops, awesome. Okay. 
So this is exactly that course, and this is my Jupyter Hub. Um, what I've done is if I just close this, you can see from the launcher, if you scroll down and you click terminal, that should launch a new terminal session for you. So we're going to be using a terminal session throughout this uh, lesson. Perfect. Okay. So if you go to emdupreegithub.io slash git course, which is where I am here, you should see something like this. Um, and one thing that we'll see is that there are lots and lots of resources out there beyond what we're going to cover today. Um, and I'm just recommending a few here, but you can also see the slides linked out. All right, first, let's get started. So first things first, we want to track changes in a local repository. We're going to learn what that means. Um, but first, let's talk about why we're using the command line. So some of you may be familiar with common uh, desktop clients like GitHub Desktop or Git Kraken, which are really wonderful, actually. Um, I definitely recommend them. But we're deliberately not going to use a GUI for this course. And that's for a couple of reasons, actually. The first is that if you're working at the command line, I find that you end up with a better understanding of how Git commands work. And then once you have that understanding, you can, of course, go to the GUIs if it's easier um, or if you just like the look of them. Uh, but it's starting at the command line makes it really clear about how all the different pieces work together. The next is when we're working at the command line, we'll be able to use Git on any computer, um, including uh, high performance computing systems, which generally only allow Linux command line access. And then, of course, if you start uh, with one GUI, it's very easy to learn to that GUI. Um, so if we start at the command line, we can transfer it to any GUI. So you could switch, say, from GitHub Desktop to Git Kraken pretty easily. But when you're starting at the command line, the first thing is you just have to set it up, right? So this is something where we have to tell Git who we are and how we're going to work with Git. So the first thing we need to do is tell Git who we are. So there are two dimensions of this. Um, that I think we're gonna we're gonna need here. Of course, there are others you could imagine adding, but the first is we're gonna tell it our name and our email. Um, and this is really important because everyone who uses Git has to do this. Um, so if we think back to this idea of a conversation, maybe even the example from the PhD comics of writing a paper, you want to know who rewrote the conclusion section, right? You don't want to just allow anonymous editing um, because then it could be a little confusing if you're working with a couple collaborators about who's suggesting what changes. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell Git um, what our name is and what our email. And the way we do that is just by typing git config global user dot name and then in quotes your name. Now because we're doing this global, it's going to persist across our image or if you're executing this locally. So if you're, um, I suggested that you could if you'd prefer execute it locally if you have git installed. In that case, it would persist across your computer over time. So you would only really need to do this once per computer. And then I'm going to do the same thing. Oops, same thing with my email. My old email that I just used for Git. Um, OK, perfect. So. Now, Git knows a little bit about who we are. Um, but we also need to tell it how we'd like to work with it. So there are a couple of different things we could do. There's something um, we could think about later when we talk about passwords, where we could uh, have it store our credentials for a certain amount of time. But first things first, we really just need an editor. And by that, I mean we need something that is in plain text that we can easily work with um, to give Git information that it needs. So I'm going to say, because I checked on JupyterHub and this was the most common editor that I could find, we're going to use Vim. Um, if you're on your own system, you could use kind of any editor you like, so long as it's a plain text editor. Um, for example, you could use Notepad or Emacs. Um, but we're going to use Vim. So we're going to do git config global core dot editor Vim. Oops. Then. Nice. Okay. Now, if we do cat 
which is just a shell command. Um, then we can see all of these settings that we've done. Perfect. Okay, and there was a question about can we use Sublime instead of Vim? Um, and absolutely. So you can use, you can see here that you can set it up to use text edit. Um, I could actually even set it up to use the default text editor in Jupyter Hub. Um, but you need to, to configure it such that it would launch that editor. Um, so here, for example, with text edit, you see that it's saying open with the, with the particular text edit options. But that's a great question. Okay, and there's another question, but we're going to get to it in just a bit. Um, so don't worry. All right, perfect. So yeah, so as we said, as you can see here, you can see the git config. You can see the parameters we provided. And again, because we did the global commands, this is going to persist um, for at least a little bit. Uh, and if you had this on your own local computer, this would persist uh, much longer. So you would really only need to do it once per computer. All right. So now that we have told Git a little bit about who we are and how we'd like to work with it, let's create our first what's called repository. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change into our home directory, which you can check just by doing PWD and you should see something just like this. Um, so home slash Jovian if you're on the Jupyter Hub. And we're going to make a directory called Git Papers. And then we're going to change into that directory, Git Papers. And now if you do ls for list, there's nothing in it. But if we do git init, which is short for initiate, initiate the repository, um, it's going to say initialize empty git repository in home jovian git papers dot git. So what have we done exactly? Um, well, we're still in git papers. You can tell just from the terminal prompt even. Um, but if we now look in this uh, repository and we do ls dot git that directory told us we just created we can see all sorts of things are included right all of these are different configuration files for git um, so these tell git different pieces of info about what's happening currently in this folder or repository um, and what we've done previously so the important thing for us right now is we want to make sure we don't accidentally delete this directory um, because then it wouldn't be a Git repository and we would lose access to all the really cool features of Git that we're going to learn about. All right, now let's go ahead and create a file. So let's say we're going to use that example still from PhD Comics that we're going to write a journal paper. Um, so first, let's just start by adding some other names and a title. So if I do journal.md, I can do mo. I there we go. All right. If you haven't worked with them before, sorry. I should add a little piece of warning here. Um, so when you first work with them, you're going to need to uh, type I, which is short for insert, and then you'll be able to insert comments or contents rather. And if you want to stop inserting contents, you'll hit escape. And then you can do things like colon and Q, which will quit the file. Okay, so I want to keep doing content. So I'll do I, and then I'll do my super amazing title. And then I'm going to say authored by Elizabeth. All right, and then I'm going to hit escape because I'm done inserting colon WQ, right and quit. All right, uh, and what if command, sorry, so there's one more question. Um, so while people are figuring out Vim, you could have gotten stuck just a bit earlier if when you tried to do ls.git, you got command was not found. So in that case, 
you're probably working uh, not on the Jupiter Hub system. If you are working on the Jupiter Hub system, let us know because that would be unexpected. But if you're not working on the Jupiter Hub system and you get uh, command not found for LS, that probably means you're working on Windows, in which case uh, you'd want to do something like um, work in the Windows subsystem uh, for Linux the WSL subsystem, which has access to these bash commands. Otherwise, there are PowerShell equivalents you can do, but I'm not going to quite have time to get into them here. But that's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or yes, there was no space between the LS and Git. Yeah, so in general, you want to make sure that your commands, uh, it's very easy to typo on here, uh, just in general when making commands. So try and make sure that you're matching, if you see an error, what is written actually in the material. Cool, okay. So great, so now we've added the author names and the paper title using them. And what we can check now is what Git knows about this repository. So now we have this journal article that we didn't have before. If we do git status, what do we see? So we'll see something just like this. So we see we're on branch master. There are no commit yet, commits yet. Um, we have one untracked file, which for me is appearing in red as journal.md. And it says nothing added to commit, but untracked files are present. Use git add to track. Uh, okay, and if you're stuck in Vim, you'll hit escape and then colon WQ. So it will look just like that. It literally, I think the most popular Stack Overflow question about Vim is how do I exit Vim? So this is a very common problem, um, mm -hmm. but we're all gonna get through it together and then we'll all have the same environment and it'll be beautiful. It's the shared struggle. Okay, so right, back to our good status. So we can see all this information, but what is it really telling us? Well, there are a couple pieces, right? Um, the first is that uh, we're on the master branch, which is the default branch in a Git repository. That's just a piece of jargon that it's called master. Um, we could name it other things, but sometimes when working with uh, the broader community, it's useful just to adopt the jargon they've adopted. It makes that, again, that conversation a little bit easier. Um, and you may be saying, okay, so that's the name of the branch, but what exactly is a branch? Branches are kind of like parallel versions of a project. And we'll talk more about branches later, but for now, let's just think of them that way, parallel versions. The other really important piece of info is that our file is listed as untracked right now, which means it's in the working directory, but Git is not actually tracking it. So any changes that we made to this file won't be recorded by Git. That is, we've gone ahead and we've added a title and an author, but if we continue to make changes, Git will see, uh, not be able to tell that we've made these changes at different points in time, right? So what do we need to do? The first thing we need to do is to tell Git about the file, or rather to tell Git to pay attention to the file. Um, and the way we can do this is by using the git add command. So if we do git add journal, md and now let's try that git status command again what we can see is that we've got some of the same information um, we have on branch master no commits yet but now where it used to say untracked files it says changes to be committed so it says we have now rather than uh, just the file name it says now we have this brand new file called journal.md and if you haven't worked uh, with these sorts of files before, MD just means markdown. Um, so yes, absolutely, there's, there's many different kinds of files, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Git can handle many different kinds of files. Markdown just happens to be one plain text file that's pretty common, so it's a good example to start with. All right, so what does it mean now um, that we've actually done this git add. So we can tell that it's giving us slightly different information. So clearly git thinks something has happened, but what's happened, right? Well, first, 
as we said before, it tells Git just to pay attention to the file. That is, that the file should be tracked and that as we make changes to it, Git should note them for us. The second is to put the file into what's called the staging area, um, also known as the index or cache. I really prefer to think of the staging area as sort of a loading dock, right? So what you can do is you make a change, you say, pay attention to this file with git add, and then it adds that change to the, the loading dock. And then you can make more changes on different files, but it's really when you do this next step that we're gonna talk about just in a second, that it kind of pushes them all um, into one little bundle. Okay, so all we've done right now is just staged the file and told Git to pay attention to it, by telling Git to pay attention to it, I should say. All right, so Git's now paying attention to it, uh, but if you may have noticed, it said no commits yet, right? So what do we need to do? We're gonna commit it. And what does that mean? That means we're gonna tell Git, this was a change that I made um, so that, you know, as we're going through that conversation, of making changes and communicating with ourselves or with our collaborators, it can be clear why we did something and when we did it. So what we're gonna have to do is just type git commit and it's gonna pop back up in our default editor, um, which in our case is Vim. So why is it popping back up? Well, git can figure out a lot of information for us. It is very clever. Um, and what it can't figure out though, even though it knows, you know, particular directories or files uh, have been committed by who and when, um, it can't figure out why, right? We have to tell it why. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide the why, why did we make this change in a commit message? And that's why it provides the editor because it's just prompting us to say, why did you make this change? What's, what's going on here? So I'm gonna say, I'm going to type I again to insert his bin, and I'm going to say uh, add title and authors. And then if I hit escape, colon, WQ, enter, now it will say one file changed, three additions, which means that the commit was successful. Okay, perfect. So now we can see, like I said, just a little bit of information about what happened. And now if we do our favorite command, git status, this really is my favorite command. Um, you can see that it says on branch master, nothing to commit working directory clean. And if we go back and we just do ls to list the files in this directory or repository, we can see the file. So this is perfect, right? What we can see is that uh, what Git is trying to tell us is that we're still on this main branch that we've started on master, um, but we've already told it everything it needs to know about the current files. So it already ha has recorded all of the changes and they haven't changed since we last recorded a commit. Um, but let's just keep going. Uh, okay, let's just keep going. So rather than typing nano journal.md, type vim journal.md, nano is just another editor. And now let's write an introduction section. So I'm gonna hit I, oops, I'm gonna correctly hit I, and I'm gonna say introduction. This is the introduction to my amazing new paper. I think this paper is off to a good start. All right, so I'm gonna hit escape, colon, WQ, and now what, right? So if we do git status, oops, status, we can see that we've gotten some changes. So we still have onbridge faster, but now it says rather than untracked or new file, it says that this journal file was modified. So if we're going to go ahead and make a change. We just need to do exactly what we did before, right? So every time that we make a change, we're gonna do this git add the file. So in this case, journal.md and then git commit. And it's gonna, again, 
ask us uh, why we're going to do uh, this change because again, Git knows when we did it, who we are, and what we did, but it doesn't know why we did it. So I'm just going to tell it that I, using I for insert, I'm going to tell it uh, that I did, let's see, wrote the first introduction and then escape colon WQ. Cool. Okay. So hopefully that answers the question of every time we make a change to a file, do we need to add it again or just commit them when you make changes? So you're doing both functionality, right? You're saying pay attention to this file. And then you're also saying you're putting in the staging area. So you need to stage it every time so you can make a commit. Um, and then the next question is only if you commit a file, git status tells you that it's modified. Um, so yes, as soon as you make a change, let's see. So here we had not yet, we had just added it, but we hadn't committed it. You can see that it still is registering this new file, right? So it is telling you that something's different, but it doesn't know why yet. Um, so you still have to do the commit to tell it why. Ah, and what happens if you do a commit, git commit without having done git add? That's a great question. Uh, let's just go ahead and try it, right? So if we do git commit right now, because we've just done a commit. Well, actually, let me do git status just to prove nothing's changed. Because again, favorite command, nothing to commit. So if we do git commit, it says nothing to commit. Right? So if you try and make a commit and you don't have anything there, by default, Git won't let you do it um, because it would be an empty commit. But that's a great question. Yeah, so, so that's why these two kind of go in a pair. You have to add the specific files that you want to belong to a particular change, um, and then you have to commit to explain what that change is doing. That's a great question. Okay, perfect. All right. So what we've done is we wrote the introduction section and then we committed and we said that we wrote the introduction. Um, sometimes you can do something slightly different where you just provide uh, the command message on the same line where you do git commit. I'm not going to use that that often just for, you know, uh, teaching purposes, but because I think it's really nice also to have the space to write longer commits. Um, sometimes when you're making a lot of changes, it's really, really helpful to explain why you're making those changes and what exactly they mean, but it is good to know. Um, so we can go ahead and we can do something else. So if you got a little lost before in making this file, no worries, let's make the next one and then hopefully that'll be a little bit easier to see kind of the process. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a directory using just the shell command which was short for make a directory. Uh, and we're gonna call it common. So this is something, let's say that we share in common across all our collaborators or maybe uh, in common across a couple of projects, right? And so we're gonna say that in this directory common, we're gonna have references. So maybe these are some really common references we use across a bunch of our papers. So what I can do is just type vim common slash references and it'll go ahead and create that file for me. Um, but I need to populate it with content, right? Like if I were to just exit now, it would be a blank file. It wouldn't be helpful for our very important references, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to hit I for insert. And then we're going to say Smith 2009 super important paper nature neuro. And what that's going to do then is we've got this content. So now we're going to save the file by doing escape colon WQ. And that's going to save the file out. And now let's also add that same citation in our introduction section. So let's do Vim journal. And then I'm going to say uh, I to insert say this is the introduction to my amazing new paper based on results from Smith 2009. Escape colon WQ. 
Cool. Okay, so all we've done is we used our text editor to go ahead and make this new file, references.txt, and we've edited our existing journal file um, such that it uses this reference. So let's just check in. Let's say git. What do you think is the status of this repository? Well, now it says uh, that you may recognize this from before. We have untracked files, which is this whole common directory. If you remember in the beginning, journal was an untracked file. And now it's saying that journal is modified, just like it did last time when we added the introduction. So what are we going to do? Let's go ahead and git add common. And let's do git status again. And now it's saying, OK, I have this brand new file. Not only is it the common directory, but it's specifically this file references.txt, which is great. Um, and what we could do is we could go ahead and make uh, a commit where we could add this and journal to the staging or the loading dock area and then reference them. So there's a shorthand way to do that here, which again, I'm providing because I think it's really useful, but I'm going to just go ahead and write it out. And basically what this is doing is just saying yeah, add all uh, modified files and then do this, do this shorthand commit message. But let's do things the long way because sometimes that's you know more clear. Um, so I'm also going to add, get, add journal and then I'm going to do git commit and I'm going to say I for insert and then reference Smith and add references file. Oops, can't spell file. Then escape colon WQ. Perfect. Okay, so now if I do get status, what's happened? It says on branch master, nothing to commit working directory clean. And again, what's really happening here is we had these changes in the first file, which was journal.md, and then we added the second file, which was references.txt. Both of them were added to the staging area or the loading dock at the same time. And then we use one git commit and we tell git that, you know, we made these two sets of changes, but they all have the same why. They all have the same reason. So it bundles them into the same commit so that, that we can see uh, exactly what was done, when, and why. Um, so just kind of as some key points that I want to go ahead and point out here. Um, we've gone through a lot of commands already, right, and a lot of ideas. The first is that git init initializes a new repository. So what that really is going to mean is just a folder of work that git is going to pay attention to. So it needs to be a folder um, that you have on your local system. Git status is our favorite command, and it shows the status of the repository at any point in time. Um, files can be stored in a project's working directory that is just in the folder, but until you add them to the staging area, they're not going to be considered uh, for a commit. And then when you commit them, Git is going to keep track of them. Um, we'll see a little bit next about accessing the history, but it's going to keep track of them over the long term. So, to get files into the staging area, we use, this, we use this git add, and then we use git commit to tell git why we did something, right? Because it already knows what we did and it knows when we did it, but it doesn't know why. Um, so the important thing with a commit is because, again, this is a conversation, you're telling why, you always need to write a log message uh, just explaining why you did a particular change. Cool. Okay, so we're at 40. Um, I want to take a quick 10 minute break maybe, but before we do that, there are two questions I think we could get to really quickly. One is, uh, why are there two, uh, okay, three questions. I think we can do this. Okay, first, why are there two stages and then finally committing the file, add and then commit? Is there any purpose? Great question, right? So the idea, is, the question, as I understand it at least, is like, uh, why can't I just do one command, like git both, let's say, that would both add and commit the file. And the reason is that sometimes you may want to add different pieces of a file. Sometimes you may want to add several files. Really kind of the unit or the currency that git is working in is a commit itself, right? And because the commit, again, thinking back to our conversation, is the message. It's the 
why did something happen, what happened, when did it happen, it's sort of the logical unit. And so there are uh, different ways you could think about um, combining or considering um, changes. And so having this two-step process makes it really flexible. So say if you edit five files and two of the, those edits belong to one conceptual unit, one commit, but the other three belong to a different one, it makes it really easy to break it up. Whereas if you're doing uh, kind of a combined command, it's actually quite difficult in some circumstances. Um, okay, when you get commit, do you enter a single message for each commit, regardless of how many files were added or modified? Great question. So I think this is kind of the inverse of, of the previous question, right? In that you would get commit, you would count as a commit those things which are logically grouped. So if you see really fine grained distinctions, then you would actually want to put those in separate commits. Like if they're, you know, if they're two different ideas. So if in one series of changes, you're uh, overhauling maybe the figures and then in another series of changes, you're updating the reference list. When I go and describe to someone what I did, right? I would usually say I overhauled the figures and I updated the reference list. So you would keep those separate. Um, in which case you would have one commit message for each of those two. When would you not add a file? This is a good question too, right? So we've sort of covered the idea that if you're uh, adding a file, it has something to do with some conceptual change. You could not add a file if you didn't feel like it belonged to a conceptual change that you were making. Maybe you were gonna include it a little bit later. There are also some other reasons that we'll get into uh, a bit more when we get in more into GitHub. Um, or you know whatever your favorite Git client is. Like I, I saw the question earlier about GitHub versus GitLab. So a lot of these lessons transfer over between the two. We're just using GitHub. But for example, if your file contains something like a password, um, you probably don't want to commit that because then it would be uh, publicly available if you chose to push it to GitHub. So something like that could be a really good reason to not uh, add or commit something. Um, OK, one more question, and then we'll take a break. The question is, do people write full manuscripts in Vim and using Git? There definitely are people who do this sort of stuff. Um, I'm not one of those people. Uh, but I do, I would say actually it's quite common. I have done this to write uh, manuscripts in LaTeX and Git. I think Overleaf is a, is a service which makes this really, really nice and easy, but a lot of people will also just do it directly uh, on their local environments. And I think that pairing works quite well. The key is that you have to be writing in a plain text format. So for example, using a dot doc, like a Microsoft Word format won't work because that's actually a binary format. So if you try and open that dot doc file or dot docx in something like a text editor, we give you a bunch of symbols. Um, and so Git can't, it can't know quite as well uh, what exactly you've changed. It can just see that something has changed. So, you know, writing in that environment and using kind of the Git version control system is a little harder, but for something like LaTeX or, or Markdown, it's actually quite easy and quite nice. So there are definitely people I've seen do that. Awesome. Okay, it's 45. Should we take a, a quick break and then come back in? Uh, I'm looking at Aria, sorry. Um, and then come back in like uh, five to 10. Sounds great. Awesome. Pause this. I should say if you're uh, sitting here and you want to ask questions, feel free to go to also to the Slack channel and put down your yes. questions there. And I'll try to do that while uh, Elizabeth is taking a break. I was going to say, I'll try and. Uh, and keep Elizabeth it open should uh, take a break and <laughs> get, get up and walk. It's crucial. I want you to get up and walk. I'll at least get the dog outside.
Uh, okay, and there's a new question. Uh, I need to get this to stop doing that. But I was going to say, there's a new question which we'll cover in like just the next section. So it's perfectly timed um, about getting different versions of the repository. Let me see if I can just use notifications. Thanks, Ariel. I just got your GitHub tag. All right, we are right at 10 minutes. So I think we are probably gonna go ahead and get started again. If that's all right with folks who are here. Let me just go ahead and go to the next section. Okay. Is it okay with you if I start again? Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully the quick 10 minute break did a little bit to help this start soaking in. It Again, it's just going to take time and we're just going to keep practicing through it. Um, and so let's go ahead and check in on where we are, right? Oops, this one. Aha. Okay. So you should still see something like this in your terminal, where if you had just done git status, you would see nothing to commit, working tree clean. Cool, all right, but let's say we realize we actually have a change that we'd really like to make. We forgot to reference the second paper in our introduction section. What are we gonna do? Let's go ahead and restart Vim on this journal.md file. And now we're gonna add a second paper so we're going to say Smith 2009, oops, sorry. So as a reminder for everyone, you hit I for insert. And then I'm going to say comma, uh, 
let's say another paper that would be really cool. Let's say it's my paper. I definitely had a really cool paper in 2012, for sure. Um, right, so I want to add this new second reference to the introduction. So I'm gonna do escape colon WQ. And now that's gone ahead and add it. So let's see. One thing that we've done before is we just kind of kept in our head, right? What were the different changes? And we told Git what those changes were uh, by doing uh, Git commit. But Git can actually, because we've been doing this, now kind of give us some information about what's changed. This is super useful. So if I do Git diff, which is short for difference, and then the file, it's going to show me these lines, right? So it shows me the, this line in red with a little minus sign in front of it and the next line in green with a little plus sign in front of it. And what does that mean? This means uh, the minus in front means that a line was deleted and the plus means that a line was added. Um, so what we're seeing is the removal of an old line and the addition of the updated line. And you can tell that what the difference is between these lines is just this little bit right here. So this is really, really cool. Now we can use Git to specifically understand what we've changed at any point in time within our files. This is really useful. Okay, and you can provide some useful options. Go ahead and check them out later, um, but just know that they're there. Many of the com Git commands have really useful options that we won't get uh, time to go through today, but it's really, really nice to know that they're all there. All right, so now we've gone ahead and we've made this change, but we haven't, you know, staged it or committed it. So let's go ahead and do both. Git add, oops, git add journal.md, git commit, reference, uh, okay, I reference second paper in intro, escape, colon, WQ, perfect. Now, all right, this is where it gets really fun. So we've been making some changes. We've been telling Git all about them. We've just learned how to see differences in Git where it can tell us what's different between, for example, what we've just done in the last commit. But we can also ask it to tell us all about everything we've ever done, which is kind of crazy. So if we do Git log, what you can see is it starts uh, from the bottom and goes up. You can see the different commit, what are called hashes. These are sort of unique identifiers. You can see who made a commit. You can see when they made the commit. And you can see why they made the commit or what the commit actually did, right? This is really, really cool. Um, this provides us with a record of what we did at every point in time. Um, when working with, in this case, this paper, but you can imagine with any kind of project, with any code base, with, you know, anything that you're working on where you put it on GitHub. So what else can we do? So we just learned about this git diff, but you can actually do git diff of a commit ID. So let's go back here before we added any references. If we choose this one, whoops, that's not right. Okay, if we choose this one, wrote the first introduction, I'm just going to go ahead and do BF16D66. Don't worry, I don't need to do the whole thing. Um, you just need to do the first few characters and then Git will figure the rest out. Usually if you do the first five or six. So what I can see is that by comparing Git diff for this older commit to my current one, I can see that in the original one, I had uh, just this little bit, but, or rather, I added this stuff there, uh, but now I've added all of this other stuff. So here, originally, I had, this is the introduction to my amazing new paper, but I hadn't yet added all this other information about the references that I wanted to cite, and I also hadn't added in the references.txt this Smith 2009 reference, right? So what I'm seeing is the pluses are things that were added in my most recent commit, and the minuses are things that used to exist in that previous commit. So I can right away see the difference um, between what used to be there in that commit and what's currently there. I can also see the difference 
uh, between two specific commits. So if I say git diff 0a687 cf, so that's this very first commit here, and I want to uh, compare it to the newer one. So again, let's just do for because it's easier bf16d667. I can see that what changed between those two commits is that just like this commit message says, I just added the introduction. Um, so this is really, really nice because now not only do I get all the information in the Git log about what happened, uh, or not sorry, what happened, but when something happened, who made a commit, uh, why did they make that commit, I can also use this information to particularly access what that commit did, so what it changed. Um, and this is super useful because now I can access a version of my history the entire time I've been using Git. Um, I can also do something else, right? So if I change this git diff command and I instead just do git checkout, so I'm going to do git checkout this commit where I wrote the first introduction. It's going to give me this little bit of a warning, right? It's going to say you're in this detached head state. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you can look around, make experimental changes, uh, but you know, we're not going to retain any commits you make. So it tells me head is now at this commit hash, uh, wrote the first introduction. So let's just look around. So if I do ls, now if you remember, we made that common directory, that's gone, right? So where did it go? What happened? Uh, what's actually happening is Git is allowing us to time travel in a way. So what we're able to do is to use that commit and by doing checkout, we can check out what the repository looked like at that version in time. It's giving us a warning that because we've done all this stuff since, it just assumes that we want to look around. It assumes we don't want to make any particular commits. And that if we do want to make commits, we have to follow this kind of check out a new branch routine. But at least we can see exactly what the repository looked like at this point in time. Um, and don't worry, right? So we're just checking this out. We're not committing to this. If we want to get all of our changes back that we've made, we can just do git checkout master. That will, again, master is just the jargony name for the main branch. That switches us back to uh, our most recent commit. And if we do ls, we can now see that the common directory is back. So this is pretty cool, right? We can now use git to sort of time travel. Um, and jump to the various different stages of our repository and see all of the changes that we've made there. Okay, um, there are a couple key points here when you're really thinking about history. The first is that git log is going to show you all of the changes that you've made. You can also use git diff to compare uh, differences between commits, either between two specific commits or between your most recent version and a given commit. And then you can use git checkout to go check out uh, the repository at a previous commit and see what it looks like. Um, so this is really, really cool and allows you to really take advantage of the versioning system and version control, right? So that's really exciting. It makes it much easier to understand how the, the conversation, as we're going to call it, evolved over time. Awesome. Okay. So I promised you I'd talk about branching and I keep saying this thing, you know, the master branch and the head and da 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 da. Like, what, what am I talking about? What does that actually mean? So I told you it's a parallel version of a project, but let's dig into it just a bit because it's actually really, really useful to know and to understand what's going on here. So if I say git status, it's going to give me this same message where it says on branch master, nothing to commit, working directory clean. It's this on branch master that we're going to pay attention to for us just a second. You'll also remember from the last lesson that we said git checkout master and it took us back to the most recent version of the commit. So clearly this is doing something useful. Um, ah, okay. And there are a couple of questions. Sorry. So let me, let me get to the bottom of this and then I'll just go back to those. So, all right, so one thing to note is that not only can our 
can get, rather, store changes to individual files and directories, it can actually store multiple sets of changes, which we can use, edit, and update in parallel. Um, so each of these sets of changes or parallel versions is termed a branch in Git kind of world. Um, and master, again, is just the convention for the default branch. But a new branch can be com created from any commit which means at any point in time, you can go ahead and create a parallel copy of your project that'll run alongside it. Um, this can be really useful if you're doing things like, uh, for example, in a code base, <clears throat> if you wanna try out a new feature and think about you know, what could I do to get this feature working, uh, you can go ahead and get that in a branch and then maybe think about you know, if you're happy with it, bringing it back in later rather than trying the feature in the main code base uh, when you're not yet sure it's going to be a very useful one. This is also really useful if you're keeping with the paper metaphor. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm writing papers, I realize that you know there's a slightly different take I could use in the introduction or discussion to kind of situate it in the field, but I'm not really sure that I want to commit to it, right? I want to try it out. Maybe you know in, in Google Docs, I'd have a, an alternative copy of the document where I'd edit and try this new introduction and then I'd have my usual one in a different Google Doc. Git makes it really seamless to have those just side by side in two branches, all within the same Git repository. So you don't need two repositories, you just have it right in one place. And then if you like uh, the changes, you can actually merge those changes back into the master branch so you have easy access to them. So we're gonna practice a little bit with branching, but first let's go back and let's answer just a few of the questions that folks had. Um, okay, so the first one was, where are we getting the short, shortened commit IDs from? That's a great question. Um, so this is the full commit ID, and you could type in the entire thing if you'd like. Um, Git is going to go ahead and, and use the entire thing. So if I control C, control V, yeah, so I can just copy and paste that whole thing in. But an alternative, which you'll sometimes see on GitHub, is that you don't need the full commit in most situations to know, or the full commit hash, to know what the unique commit is. So you can just use a few characters and it's equivalent. Um, I just took them from the beginning of the commit. But again, you could just use control C and control V to copy the whole commit hash in and grab it itself. Um, okay, the next question, just on kind of Git history again, was what if we accidentally commit after checking out a particular commit? Can it be retracted? Ah, yes. Okay. There's so many questions always about editing history. We're not going to have a lot of time to get into editing history, um, but absolutely, yes, you can remove a particular commit. Um, but one note is that if you accidentally commit after checking out, as you may have noticed before, it told us, um, and I'll just scroll back up so you can see, it gives us this little long message, right? So if you try to commit in this new branch, it would actually tell you that you're not, you're in a detached head state, you can't make commits. So I wouldn't worry too much about the particular instance you're describing of accidentally committing after checking out. Um, but yes, if in general you make a commit you don't want to make, there are definitely ways to uh, remove it. And then, um, okay, someone has a particular question about having this .swp file. Uh, that might just be your particular setup. So in general, um, again, like let's just think through kind of what we've done so far. When you have a new file, because you've initialized this Git repository, Git is gonna notice right away if you have new files that it hasn't been told to pay attention to or it doesn't have commits associated with, which is what that untracked files bit means. So you have two options, right? You could either, um, if the file is intentional and you just don't want it in uh, Git, you could just ignore it, let it live in untracked files forever. Um, or you could uh, add it if it's intentional and you want it there. Um, there are a couple other things you could do that we're not going to have a ton of time to get into today. Like, for example, if you want to ignore it, but you want it to stay where it is, um, there's a file that you could use called .gitignore. 
Um, and I'll definitely piece some stuff in about that later. But again, we're not going to have time to talk about it today. Just know that there are solutions for the case where you have a file, you want it to be there, but you don't want Git to pay attention to it. That does happen. Um, and again, all of these things can be combined with branches, right? Because what branches are doing is it's allowing you to just have side by side copies of a project. Um, so again, this is really, really useful because, for example, if you have two different Google documents, uh, you'd have two different Google documents. And what this is basically allowing you to do is switch in back and forth between the content uh, in the same repository or folder just with this branch command, which we're going to talk about next. Okay, cool. Um, Yes, and then, so I told you if you're happy with this particular set of changes, so if you have two branches and you say, you know what, actually I really like this reframing of the introduction, I wanna merge it in to master or the main branch. Um, it's really nice in that the merged branch is not deleted. So I could then keep developing in it. If I'm like, actually I have an even more radical reframing kind of in the same lines, I could keep developing it there and then just pull in changes when I want them. So this sounds really cool. Why don't we try it out, see what it looks like. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do um, git checkout B, where if you remember, so we did git checkout before to check out a particular commit. The B flag here means branch. So we're gonna check out a new branch and I'm gonna call it paper with, oops, with John. So uh, let's say that this is my colleague and we're now going to write this paper together. So I switched to this new branch paper with John. Um, and just in general, there are a couple of changes that John would really like us to make. Um, but let's make sure that we're in the right place to make them. So first, if we do git branch, oops, git branch, we can see a listing of all of the branches so far. And you'll notice that this asterisk is always over whichever branch you're currently on. So because I just checked out this branch paper with John, it's going to tell me that I'm currently on the paper with John branch. Now let's go ahead and make changes. So I'm going to do Vim, our, our journal, our main journal article. It's progressing pretty quickly, guys. I think it's looking really good. Um, so I'm going to hit I for insert. And then I'm going to go up and I'm going to say authored by Elizabeth and John because John's joined in. And I'm also going to change it from my super amazing title to our super amazing title. Collaboration feels good. We need to, we need to highlight it. All right. So now let's hit escape colon WQ. That's right and quit. And now if we do get status, we can see that we've modified this journal article just like before, right? Exactly the same pattern. So just like before, we're gonna do git add journal, git commit. It's gonna launch Vim for us. I'm gonna hit I for insert, and then I'm gonna hit modify title and add John, oops, can't spell his name, John as co-author. And I'm going to escape colon WQ. So I've just told Git why I made this particular change. Now, I remember I've done all of this in the branched paper with John. So if I do Git checkout master, it'll tell me that I switched to the branch master. And now here's what's really cool. If I do cat, which is just a Unix command to list the contents of a file. Um, if I do cat journal.md, Uh-oh, what happened? What you can see happened is that this is the original copy. This is the one where the paper is not yet written with John, right? So I have both of these copies existing side by side, and I can seamlessly switch back and forth between them. Um, so this is really, really cool in that now I have a way uh, to maintain kind of the paper version that I was working on and also the new paper version where I have my colleague John as a co-author. Um, and they both live side by side and I don't have to choose between them until you know, we decide like, okay, we're officially adding John as a co-author or something like that. 
So this is really cool. Um, I think this is really, really nice and it's super useful. We'll talk a little bit, we may not have a ton of time actually to talk about um, pull requests, but particularly when you're working with other people in a, like an open source context or you know, even just um, kind of good practice working with your own lab. If you're doing what are called pull requests, uh, having different branches for different ideas makes it really, really easy to see, okay, what belongs where um, and try out new things in, in kind of a safe space where you're not affecting other people's code or, or the ideas or papers. All right, so what do we learn? Git branch creates a new branch. We use feature branches for new ideas and fixes or features, and then we can merge these into the master or main branch. And merging doesn't delete any branches. So this is really, really nice. So we can keep this copy um, of what we've been working on and how we were thinking about it at different points. All right, let's look at the question. Um, cool. So I've gotten that one. To check out a new branch, should the branch already exist or, ah, okay, yes, great question. So if you do check out B branch and the branch already exists, so check out B branch means that the branch already exists, right? So let's see what happened here, right? So if I do get checkout master, I'm not providing the B because the master branch already exists. Similarly, if I want to switch back, I can do get checkout paper with John and it switches to the branch paper with John. And then if I do the same command, I can see the difference directly. So if the branch already exists, you don't need to provide that B flag. You can just do git checkout and it switches you right over. Um, the next thing, uh, which of the branches or file versions will show up in your local document browser, like a finder or an explorer? Great question. Um, so whatever one you are currently on. So whatever you're currently having Git point to, that is the one that you'll be able to uh, access. So right now, for example, as I said, I'm now on paper with John. So if I, let's see, Git papers. Yeah. So if I were to open with Markdown preview, I can see that Paper with John is the version that I'm accessing. But if I do git checkout master, and then I do the same thing, now it's the Elizabeth one, right? So whatever branch you're currently on is the one that you'll be able to access through your uh, file browser. If we want to go back to a branch, how do we access it? Great question. Again, it's just this Git checkout. That'll allow you to check out different branches. How do we merge those branches? We will get to that. Um, it's a great question. Uh, yes, and we will we will get to that very soon. Cool. Okay. It seems like people are pretty cool with branches. I think they're pretty cool. Um, and again, this is like really nice because if we're thinking about it, so just to take stock of what we've done so far, we've told Git to pay attention to a particular folder or collection of files. We found a way to allow it to track exactly what we've done at every point and why, um, such that it makes it really easy. You know, if you come back to this repository in six months or a year, it's much more clear what changes were made when and by whom. Um, we've also learned how to uh, actually access those changes ourselves using git log and, and using git diff or git checkout to explore different copies of the repository, including different branches, which are just parallel copies that we can keep alongside one another as spaces to test out different ideas or uh, different features. Awesome. All right. Now we're going to try GitHub. Um, and this may not work. It might, we're gonna just figure it out together, right? So it's always one of the fun challenges of doing things at scale with several hundred people is we'll just see how it goes. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about why we'd like to try GitHub, right? So everything that we've been doing so far has just been happening on our local computers. And what I mean by that is 
we now have a really great copy for ourselves, that point of, you know, six months ago me, um, who doesn't answer emails, I can at least go to this and I can get a few answers about what exactly happened and when and why I made particular changes. But there are a couple of reasons why this might not be perfectly ideal to only have this one copy, right? The first is the worst, arguably, which is like, what happens if this computer crashes? Or, you know, if I make all these changes on JupyterHub and then the JupyterHub goes offline at some point in the indefinite future, like that would be bad, right? I wouldn't have access to these anymore. So it's nice to have things in uh, several locations. And one of the really nice things about it is it's this distributed model, which means it's really, really easy to actually mirror things in multiple locations. So you could mirror it um, between different computers. For example, if you have both a laptop and a desktop, you could mirror it between those. I only have a laptop, um, so I, I don't live that life, but it's another option for those of us with only one, com uh, one computer would be to use this remote repository service called GitHub. So GitHub is a company um, and it provides functionality similar to many other services such as GitLab or Bitbucket um, in that you can do a couple of really cool things, right? So you can have your code mirrored there um, which allows you just a way such that, you know, if your computer is lost or if uh, it breaks, then you don't lose any of your work. You already have a backup right there. It also allows you to browse code directly from within a web browser. You get some really nice syntax hiding, highlighting. Um, you get all kinds of really fun things about issue and bug tracking and project management tools. And in particular, I'm going to focus on GitHub because it's perhaps the most popular right now. Um, one of the things that's really nice about it for researchers is it has really lovely integrations for things like making your code citable. So providing a DOI for your code such that other people can recognize your work. Um, so we're going to use GitHub. Again, all of these lessons transfer over to your favorite client like GitLab or Bitbucket. Um, but, you know, you just have to choose one on a particular day. Okay, cool. So I'm assuming you have an account. Uh, please have an account. But if you don't have an account, again, it's really, really quick. You can just sign up or sign in. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go on GitHub and we're going to create a new repository. So I'm going to log in. I'm going to actually put this in a new browser window so you can see both at once. All right. So I'm going to go to GitHub. I'm going to click this little plus button and I'm going to click new repository. And then it's going to ask me what I would like to call the repository name. It has a couple cute suggestions, but I'm going to call it Git Papers. Um, I'm going to make this public because it's just going to be easier for all of us. Don't worry, we're not going to put any sensitive content here. Um, and because we're going to be importing a local repository, which means I'm going to use this Git Papers that we've all been working on, and I'm going to have it on GitHub, I'm going to make sure that I'm not initializing this repository with a readme or with that git ignore file I mentioned to you or with a license. We're going to have all of those things locally and we're going to worry about them there. And then I'm going to click create repository. So if you do that, you'll get a page with all kinds of information, right? Uh, this is a little bit overwhelming, but GitHub is just trying to be really, really helpful. One of the things with Git and GitHub is that if you look at the error messages, they're actually unbelievably helpful. Um, so what are we going to do? First, we're going to see what it says where it said to push an existing repository from the command line, because this is exactly the situation we're in, right? We've already made one, and we'd like to have this repository that's on our local computer mirrored on GitHub. So we need to push it there. So we're going to do exactly what it says here. So if you just copy this line, git remote add origin, actually, you can click this little clipboard and it'll copy them both for you. We come back here and we can paste it. So what this has done is it just went ahead and executed that first line, get remote add origin, this URL. Um, and what it's actually doing, maybe before we execute the next line, is it's saying, okay, 
you have your local copy, which you've been editing. I'm going to have a remote copy for you, but I need to know a few things about this remote copy. I need to know a quick name, a nickname that we can give it. The convention here, just like the convention for the main branch is master, the convention for the quick name is origin. You could pick your favorite name, um, but we're going to stick with origin because again, sometimes when we're starting out, just using the conventions is easier. And then, so I have its nickname and then I also have the URL that it's going to point to. And now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to push my copy. So you can literally imagine pushing from this local version up to the nicknamed URL on the master branch. And the U, you only need to do that the first time. It just means, uh, you know, this is, this is where it's going to push up to, short for upstream. Okay. So now if you try and do this, it'll ask you a couple questions. The first is your username, because you've already signed up for GitHub, you know your username. And the second is your password. So I'm going to grab my password. Okay, perfect. All right, hopefully, because of issues with scale, I'm not sure if you got exactly this wonderful message, but hopefully you did. Um, and if you did, we can all thank Eric and Ariel for all their work. So, okay, perfect. So what is this very long message I just got, right? Um, there's a lot of information in here. Uh, so there are a couple things that I think we need to pick out first is kind of the key points. The first is that we've pushed to this location and we've created a branch in that location called master, which mat matches our local copy. Um, and then it's telling us that branch master is now going to track master on origin. And then remember, origin's just a nickname. So what this means is that we now have actually a bi-directional linking. So if we make changes in our local copy on the master branch, or if we make changes on our GitHub copy on the master branch, we can go back and forth between those really seamlessly, which is super cool, right? So like if I go on vacation and I realize, you know, while I'm uh, at home in the States that I need to change something on my repository, but I don't have my laptop, I can just make the change directly on GitHub and it will automatically be able to sync back to my laptop copy. This is really, really nice. And it makes it such that you don't lose your work, um, which is you know, one of the huge benefits of these kinds of version control systems is that we always have a copy of our work no matter where we are. Awesome, okay, cool. So this is awesome, but let's go ahead and let's go back to GitHub. So remember, I just told you we pushed this to GitHub. So I'm gonna do this in the same window as my Jupyter lab. So if I do Ian Dupree, Git, Oh, no, get papers, which is where I just pushed it to. Look at that. Now I have uh, all those files that I had just added, right? And I can even click on them in the browser and I can see exactly what I saw in my local copy. So this is really, really cool. Now all of my work is already present here. All right. So this is awesome. So now we have a way where we can see all of our changes. And one thing I didn't mention is if I make this broader, uh -huh. you click on this little commit hash and it will actually show you exactly what change was made for that given commit, which is just super cool. I can click on four commits and just like git log, I can see all of the changes that I've made. So everything that we did locally, we can now do remotely. I love it. Okay, so remember though, we had two branches. We had master and we had paper with John. So we can actually also push up our other branches. So this paper with John branch to the remote repository as well. And we're gonna do it in a very similar way. I'm gonna do git push origin paper with John. It's going to ask me for exactly the same information.
Okay, and now you should be able to see that just like before, now it says we have this new branch paper with John that's been pushed up. Awesome. Okay, cool. Let's just go ahead and check in and see how the questions are going. Um, if we want to go back to the branch, how do we access it? Uh, again, this is just the Git checkout. Um, so if you mean locally, what we're doing is just Git checkout to switch between the branches. And we can do Git branch A to list all the branches, including the new remote ones we just made. And you can see that this star tells us where we are now. So if we want to check out Paper with John, we literally just do Git checkout Paper with John. And it switches us over. And we can go back to Master. So it's a really quick way to switch back and forth between everything. And now that we have this remote, uh, which is our GitHub in our case, we can also see copies of what the branches look like on the remote. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. There are some questions where people had an issue uh, with permissions, in which case you want to make sure that the repository exists on GitHub. So remember, we went to GitHub first and we clicked create remote repository. You want to make sure that it exists on GitHub before you try and push anything there. Otherwise, it'll be like, but I don't have anything here. Where do you want me to put this? Um, the other thing is to make sure that you have the right credentials so that you have the right username and password. Um, and again, this would just be whatever you used when you set up GitHub. Or again, equivalently, if you set up GitLab or Bitbucket, it would be whatever you used there. That's sort of specific to that platform. Um, and sorry, I'm just reading really quickly. Okay, and then the other thing is if you weren't prompted for your username and password, there's a, so this is a good question. There's a couple possibilities. Uh, one is that if you've recently done your username and password, you can set up GitHub such that it stores your credentials for a set period of time. So on my personal computer, I usually store them for about an hour after a push. Um, but you know, you could, to be more secure, also have it ask you every single time. So if you're not asked for your username and password, you can just check your cached credentials setting and that'll tell you like uh, how often you should expect to be queried to re-enter your username and password. For the purposes of this, I'm gonna do it every single time, but it is good to know, you know in, your, in your own development uh, kind of environment, how often you wanna be queried for it. Okay, a few more questions. Um, ah, okay, this is a really good question. If you tried to push, but permission is denied. So this could be the same problem as before, but here's a slight difference. So I'm not saying that you should push to my repository. Sorry if this was unclear. You should push to your copy. So my username is Ian Dupree, so I'm gonna push there. But the only people who can push to Ian Dupree right now, the only person is me uh, because it's I created it, right? And I haven't added anyone else's permission to push directly to it. We'll talk a little bit, actually we probably won't talk, but there's uh, an idea called pull requests where you could ask for me to pull your code into my repository. Um, but if you want to push it directly, you need access rights. And you really don't have access rights on that repository right now. Sorry, I don't know everyone's username, so there's no way I could give everyone access rights. So all you want to do is in this URL, make sure it's github.com and then your username and then git papers. And so that will allow you to push directly to your repository, which is where we want this to be going. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, here's one question. The local and remote copies will mirror changes made to either. This is a great question. So I don't mean that they'll mirror automatically, right? So if you make uh, a couple changes on your local copy, what you'll want to do is just like before, you'll need to push, uh, here we go, push the changes to the remote copy. So again, similarly, if this was laptop desktop, you know, it, it won't automatically sync the two. I would need to be working on my laptop and then choose to push to my desktop or vice versa. 
Um, you can also pull down changes made from one copy to another. So I could pull changes from my uh, GitHub copy into my local copy to have them both. But the syncing isn't automatic. It's something that you need to choose to do. That's a great question. Um, Okay, and then is Git able to edit files that you previously created and saved on your local computer, or do you need to create it through Git, and would you push it through the same way? Great question. Okay, so this goes back to kind of the idea of when we initialize a repository, right? So a repository for Git is just a collection of files in a folder um, that it's going to pay attention to. So you could bring new files into that folder and Git would now tell you, just like before, that you have an untracked file that you could add and commit and work with. Um, but it needs to be in that GitHub repository for Git to pay attention to it. As soon as it's in the repository, as soon as it's being tracked and committed, you can treat it just like we have, where you can push and pull from different remotes like GitHub. Um, so as soon as you've gotten it where you're you know, in the Git flow, um, then it works exactly the same way. Great question. Um, okay, cool. So I want to do one more thing and then I, I'll get to the last question actually. And then of course, if you have more questions in between, please ask them as well. Um, one thing that I am uh, showing, but we're not going to do it, is that if you do want to delete a branch, so as I said, when you merge something, the branch isn't deleted. If you do want to delete a branch, there is a way to do that. Um, we're not going to do it today, but just so you know, it's there. Okay. Now, if you have successfully pushed all your local branches into the remote repository, don't do this step if when you go to GitHub, you don't see both branches and you don't see all of your changes. If that's you, just ask questions or just kind of watch for the moment if you don't see those things. But if you do see those things, let's do something a little bit drastic. So let's change two dots. So cd dot dot. So change directory dot dot. That means to change up one directory. And now we're going to do something crazy. We're going to do remove recursive, I'm just going to do recursive, I'm not going to do force, get papers. And that's going to remove everything we've done on our Jupyter Hub. Again, don't do this if you don't already have it on GitHub. If you had any errors, just skip this step. Ugh, all right, I'm going to have to force it. I didn't want to do it. It's always so scary. All right, done. So now if I do LS, it's gone. Crazy, right? Um, so what have we done? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, what we've actually done is we've just wiped our local repository. Um, this is something that can really easily happen. Actually, maybe you do it accidentally. Maybe your computer breaks. Um, normally, for example, like if this were my dissertation, I would be very upset. But because we pushed to GitHub, we already have another copy, right? We haven't actually lost anything. So we can just copy down the repository that's on GitHub using Git clone. This is so useful. Slash git papers dot git. And now git papers is back. Right. So what we have now is we have this exact copy or this clone of the repository that was on GitHub. And by default, it's creating a directory with the same name as the name of the repository, which is exactly what we wanted because that's what the name was before. So now if we change into Git papers and we use Git log, we can see that it has the exact same history that we had before. And we can also show all of our branches. So I'm going to do git branch r, which shows the remote branches. And then I can do git checkout paper with John. And now it's going to go ahead and have, just like we did before, all of the information on the paper with John branch is still maintained here. So this is really cool. We didn't lose anything. 
we have everything available um, and we're able to easily grab information off of GitHub and use it on Git. So now we can just go ahead and use the cloned repository, the copied repository, just as if it were our original local repository. So let's make some more changes to the files and commit those. So again, we're gonna check out master to switch branches. We're gonna do uh, vim journal.md. We're gonna hit I for insert. And then we're gonna go down and this time, let's go ahead and add some results. Cause we've been working really hard on this paper. Now we've got some really cool results. My results are really exciting. Escape colon WQ. All right, so now we've added this results section. Let's tell Git that we added this results section. Journal.md, git commit, I add results section, escape colon WQ. And now it's gonna say, okay, you changed one file, you have four insertions and one deletion. Um, so now, how do we push these local changes back to the remote or the GitHub repository? We're going to do this just by using the push command, the git push command. So let's do git push origin master. So again, origin is just the alias for that URL we already set up, which in my case is github.com slash emdupree slash git papers. In your case, it will be github.com slash username, your username slash Git papers. So I'm going to tell it to push to that location and keep the master branch because that's the one we're currently on right now. It's going to ask me again for my username and password. Okay, cool. And now you can see that I mistyped my password and then the second time I did it correctly and it pushed up, no problem. Okay, and now if I go to Git and I refresh, GitHub rather, and I refresh, I can see that I have this new commit for adding results section. Nice, which is exactly what I did in Vim, right? So now I have that record and it's both in my local copy on the Jupyter Lab and also in my copy on GitHub. And this is really cool. GitHub isn't the only remote I could have, right? So I could also, like I said before, I could have a laptop copy, I could have a desktop copy, or maybe your home computer and your work computer, a GitHub, you could have a GitLab, you could do all kinds of things. In order to list what you currently have defined, you just do git, yeah, git remote v. And in this case, I can see that the only one I have defined besides my local copy is this one on GitHub. But just like before where I did git remote add, I could just keep going and add more to whatever makes sense for me. All right, so a few key points. Git is the version control system. It's what we're using locally, and it's really actually what's powering all of these clients like GitHub or Bitbucket or uh, GitLab. But those clients that, uh, in this case, GitHub, is just a remote repositories provider. It provides a way for us to access um, all of these local versions in remote locations. Um, Git clone makes a local copy, so it just copies uh, a remote repository to a local environment. And Git push pushes changes from a local environment to a remote repository. All right. So let's see what the questions are. And then I want to do one quick thing if we have time. Uh, Ah, okay, so this last question is the thing I want to do if we have time. Um, so let's go ahead and do it. So the question was, changes were made to the paper in John Branch, but it was pushed to master on GitHub, went and create version issues. So that's not exactly what happened, but we can do that. So what we actually did, just so we're uh, all on the same page, 
was we pushed both the master branch and the paper with John branch to GitHub. So if we go look, we can see that we have both branches here. So right now, these are existing totally in parallel and we're not trying to merge them in any way, right? So the question though is what would happen if we were trying to merge them? What would we get some kind of conflict? And so that's, you know, we're not gonna have time to do quite everything. So I think the last thing we're gonna do is to worry about this issue of conflicts. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. Um, so how we're gonna do it is, da, 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 da. I know what we're gonna do. Okay. We're going to go ahead and practice if we had multiple copies, right? So if we had multiple copies and they each had different changes, let's say, for example, if we wanted to collaborate with others. So back to this conversation idea, right? Um, how could we get the latest changes so that everyone has the latest copy? Um, one way we could do it is just to clone the repository every single time. So to make a copy from the remote onto our local computers every time that you know, someone was working in a new environment or every time someone wanted to make a change. But this is pretty inefficient, um, both because we may lose access to work that we've been doing in the meantime, but also if the repository is very large, it's just sort of frustrating to wait, you know, five minutes every time you want to make a change. So Git allows us an easy way to get the latest changes. Um, and so what we can do is to simulate this. We're going to practice as if we had two different folders on two different computers. They're both going to be on the same Jupyter lab, but we're going to pretend. So let's change directory out of Git papers and we're going to Git clone again. But like I told you before, GitHub by default gives it the name that it, of the repository, but you can give it whatever name you want. So I'm gonna clone down my copy, oops, my copy of Git papers. And now I'm gonna call it Neuro Academy papers. So now if I do LS, I can see that I have both Git papers and Neuro Academy papers. So both copies of that uh, repository exist locally. So if we pretend that these clones are on two separate machines, let's say our laptop and our desktop, now we actually have three versions of our repository in the wild, right? We have our two uh, local versions, each on a different computer, and we also have our GitHub version. So we can edit one of these versions, adding a figures section, let's say, commit the file and push the changes to GitHub. So just because we like it, we've been using it a lot. Let's change back into Git papers. We're going to edit the journal file again. And then just like before with the BIM, we hit I for insert. And we say figures. They're so beautiful. And then we do escape colon WQ. And just like before, we've made this change. We're going to tell Git, hey, this is a pretty important change. And we're going to do git commit. It'll launch Vim. I for insert add figures. Escape colon WQ. Nice. OK, so we're going to do git push going to ask for our username. It's going to ask for our password. Okay. And so now it says it's pushed those changes up to GitHub. So if I refresh, I see I have this new commit add figures, which is exactly what I wanted, right? This is exactly what we did before. Now, Let's change to the other computer, the NHA papers. And now we can do git fetch. And what that's going to do is it's going to fetch down the commits that were on 
our remote repository, in this case GitHub, and it's going to allow us to examine them. So we can see what the differences are with our old friend git diff by looking at origin slash master git diff. And I can see that compare my copy doesn't have this line. Figures are so beautiful, but the new copy does. So I like this changes. I want beautiful figures, right? This is something I'm happy about. So I can do git merge origin slash master. And it will go ahead and say, I'm fast forwarding. I've changed one file and I've inserted two things. And then we can inspect the file to see that we actually got the changes we wanted. So again, we're just going to do this cat command. Um, journal. And I can see that they're here. Yay, I have beautiful figures. You know, you could, you could do emoji figures. You could do whatever you want, right? This is, this is a really good paper. We've got results, we've got introduction. It's off to a good start. Um, okay, so what did we do here exactly? So remember, we did this git fetch followed by a git merge. Alternatively, we could do uh, a git pull, which does both of these in the same step. Um, why would you do them separately? So we're not going to have time to go through exactly that one. But basically, the idea is that git pull by doing both of them at the same time uh, has, you know, this, not a liability, but this other kind of angle, right? So if you expect that there will be a conflict, if you expect to see differences, git pull, because it's going to pull down these changes and then try and merge them in. When it hits the conflict, it's going to get upset. Um, not super upset, but it'll, it'll complain a little bit. Whereas if you do git fetch, you can then diff the changes, anticipate any merge conflicts, and deal with them. So in the last three minutes, not three minutes, but seven minutes, I'm going to quickly preview resolving conflicts because I think this is super important. Um, this is usually the part where the first time we hit a conflict, the temptation is to delete the repository, reclone it, and start over, right? Like that's completely understandable. I think that's everyone's gut feeling, but we don't need to do that. Git is actually really, really helpful. It's gonna try and help us resolve them itself. It has a lot of really helpful error messages. So let's just make a small conflict and let's see what happens. All right, so let's go ahead and pretend still that our two local cloned repositories are hosted on different machines. And I skipped a little bit where we changed into Git papers. So I'm just going to go ahead and do cd dot dot slash Git papers now, and that will change me into the Git papers part. Uh, and I have the typo again for Nano. Every time you see Nano, just use Vim. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's do Vim journal.md. And I'm going to hit I, and I'm going to add some author affiliations. So I'm going to say Elizabeth. Uh, who is at the m and in Montreal, right? Because that's, that's true. That's where I am. You can do whatever you'd like there. Then I do escape colon WQ. And that will go ahead and uh, push, or not push, excuse me. I will go ahead and make this change. So what do I need to do? I'm going to just follow the same workflow as before, git add journal.md, git commit, it will open Vim, I'll hit I and type add author affiliations escape colon WQ, and now it will say it has that change. And just as before, I'm going to git push origin master. So this should all be, you know, this is stuff we've, we've done. It's probably not quite fluid yet. Um, but you should start to see a pattern, right? We do pretty much the same steps when we're going through these things. Oops. Which is good. It's good to do the same steps over and over. It always helps. Awesome. Okay, so now I've pushed those changes up. And now um, if we go to GitHub and we refresh, we can see that we added author affiliations. So 
Let's go ahead and switch to our other local copy, pretending that it's on a different machine. So let's say I'm switching from my uh, laptop to my desktop. And now what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to make a change uh, on the same line, right? So I'm going to say um, vim journal.md. And I'm going to say also, oops, also by uh, Ariel. Escape colon WQ. That'll write it for us. All right. And now, just as before, git add journal, git commit. And then uh, change, change authorship information, and then escape colon WQ. All right, and then what I could do, and it looks like we won't quite have time to get into this, but I just want to show you exactly what we're trying to do here. Aha, all right, so we're gonna get this error message um, and it's gonna be really long and overwhelming, but I just want you to see that it has a bunch of hints. And so we won't have time to go through exactly all of the different uh, steps. I really encourage you to look at these. I think they're really, really useful, but the main message I wanna get across here is this is not a reason to panic. There is some red, it's not a big deal, uh, this is something that's super addressable and we could have a way to keep both kinds of information. So if you're interested in this, just keep going. Um, the next section is also about working with uh, pull requests, which is another really useful thing that you can do to work on repositories where you don't have right access. So again, just encourage you to check it out. Hopefully this is a good first start. Um, and you'll have lots and lots of times to practice either in the group projects or in your own work. And with that, uh, do we have time, Ariel, for like one or two questions? No, let's, no? Uh, let's, okay. take, let's take questions on Slack um, and, uh, and, and here because we're yeah, two minutes to the, next, to the next thing. Nice. Thank you Perfect. so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yep, and I'll, I'll be on Slack. So feel free to ask questions in that same channel, the lesson channel, and we can, we can talk about them there. Okay, bye.